UCSF basically was a medical school. It was a training school for physicians and that's sort of it. And a, a time of great investment in science. Our dean at the time, Jerry Goyne, was instrumental in recruiting these diverse individuals whose skill sets complemented each other so well. They sort of recruited these great people and got out of their way around 1960. And they filled them with all these young, you know, pirates. I was quite impressed with Jerry Goyen, and I was really looking for an opportunity to do more biological-oriented work than chemistry departments seemed to enjoy in those days. They said, sure, we care about that, come on out. Peter Coleman, who I had known as a graduate student at Princeton, was looking for a job. I got out here and I said, I know this really terrific young guy in a brand new field is a possibility he would have a job. And I mean, unbelievably, they hired him on the spot. Well, I was at Princeton and I looked into other places and Tech mentioned to his dean and he invited me out here. We were driving back across the Golden Gate Bridge and I was looking out of the window and said, oh, that's beautiful. He said, yes, that's why we can give much less salary to the... <laughs> <laughs> it was the dawn of when computers had gotten powerful enough to be able to simulate the actions of atoms interacting with one another and with molecules interacting with one another. We were in the physical environment of chemists, but, you know, trying to do, take a new approach to chemistry, and that was the computational approach and visualization. Up until then, drug discovery, pharmacology, you would start with a series of small molecules. Based on that, they would infer what the receptor was, and the receptor was, for most of pharmacology's history, it's just an idea to explain what ligands did. And what Tack and Peter and Bob brought was this idea of, no, we should start with the receptor as the central organizing theme and design ligands that fit in it. And the thing about proteins being as large as they are, you know, on typical scale, it fills a room. What do you do about that? How do you interact with it? And if you build these models, things fall off frequently. When you've got the model, you're fiddling around with screws. The key to understanding the function of these proteins is to understand the three-dimensional shapes of the proteins and how that three-dimensional structure delivers the, the biological function. And so visualization is the key to that. So when the computer graphics became available, for the first time you could actually see on the computer screen a rotating molecule. That was exciting. It led in a pretty direct way to the whole docking story and the other work my lab did because it gave us a way to see our results. I mean, the critical insight was that using the structures of the proteins themselves would lead to better pharmaceuticals. Bob had brought this idea of, of molecular graphics, of, of you know showing all the atoms and how they related to each other in these increasingly complex molecules. And, and that's done in the computer graphics lab that he founded here. But it wasn't quantitative modeling, and what Peter brought was quantitative modeling. What would the, if you put a small molecule into the binding site and sampled it in different places, what would the energies of interaction be, or what, what were the energies of interaction for the protein be? And so as the computers got better and the force fields improved, um, that became ever more quantitative. Um, so that was, that was his contribution. Peter was just a mentor to all the graduate students. Ball of fire, <laughs> sheer enthusiasm, uh, always excited about things, and always took time out from lunchtime and after work to go and play basketball. I think that with suitably chosen potential functions, one can get very reliable numbers as I tried to... Peter's death was a shock to all of us. Some form of cancer. And not only was he a central figure, but he left the scene so quickly. Case. Peter, we'll see you one more time for our panel discussion. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. It was a sad time for all of us, and Peter was a victim of a common disease that is you know, widely afflicts lots of people, and I think it even 
gives, you know, in some ways more inspiration to do the work that we do. Through their publications and work together, really made it into a much larger field today that is employed in the development of, of pharmaceuticals, in, in plant biology, in understanding the structural basis of diseases. You won't go into a chemistry or biochemistry department that doesn't have some kind of graphics there oh, it's all everywhere. across the world. Yeah. You won't go to any place that does any kind of chemistry without some access either to Peter's program, which is still run. So in that sense, we had, I guess, deep penetration uh, through both the academic and the uh, pharmaceutical world. And I think the whole focus on structure and, and quantitation and rigor that all of those guys had, Tack, Peter, Bob, and, and that was part of the bigger community, you know, that, that's still here. It was really a, a sort of a joint mission, and so we're still, that still informs what we do, for sure. The word enthusiasm is really sometimes poo-pooed by people when you talk about scientific research. That's the most important thing. So you get them excited about something and hope that they won't mind failing. That's crucial in any kind of scientific research. How many failures have you had? And when the fellow said, none, he said, you're not gonna make much progress. <laughs> <laughs>